This is going to be an overview of the book of Jonah. The greatest thing about Jonah is that it illustrates the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 12, 40, it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's what the Lord Jesus said, the Son of Man. He's the Son of Man. So Jonah pictures the resurrection of Jesus and him being in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Jonah preaches history's greatest revival. He preaches Nineveh, a whole location of people under conviction. Inspirationally, the book deals with a Christian who won't do the Lord's work. But Jonah's name means dove, which is a picture of the a Holy Ghost. And the book has four chapters, 48 verses, 1,321 words. If it only has 48 verses and you memorize one verse of it a day, it would take you a little bit over a month and a half to memorize the book of Jonah. But in chapter 1, you have Jonah running from God. In chapter 2, Jonah is crying out to God. In chapter 3, he's obeying God. And in chapter 4, he's angry with God. But in chapter 1, Jonah, Jonah is told to go to Nineveh and cry against their wickedness. However, Jonah doesn't want to obey the Lord in the matter and flees from the presence of the Lord. And in Jonah 1, 4, it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Have you ever experienced heavy winds? Have you ever been, at, been walking outside and been pretty much blown over by one? God controls the wind, and he's the one that sent this wind to Jonah, who was running from him. In Proverbs 30 and verse 4, it shows the Lord has the wind bound in his fists. In Matthew 8, 27, it shows us that even the winds and, those, and the sea obey God. So all it would take is just a, a wind from the Lord to have us flat on our hind end if we don't do what he says. In Jonah 1, 5, it says, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So these mariners were calling on their little g-gods. The other day I seen a picture of a Hindu carrying his big blue god in a flood. It's sad that he's having to save a god that can't save him. It's sad when you call upon your gods and they can't see, hear, or walk. But that's what these guys on the ship were doing. Something that always struck me as strange here is that even though Jonah was running from God, he was able to go fast asleep in this ship as it was being tossed to and fro. I believe this means he was really out of fellowship with God to the point he wasn't even bothered by his own disobedience. When I got some disobedience going on, I can't get it off my mind. It's not good to just go to sleep out of fellowship with God. I'd hate to go to bed at night out of fellowship with the Lord. In Jonah 1.6, it says, So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us and we, that we perish not. But in verse 9, Jonah says unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Notice that Jonah says he fears the Lord, although at this time it really doesn't look like it. I mean, the guy just ran from God, and he's asleep in his ship, that's about to go titanic on them. But something in Jonah deep down does fear God. And the men end up tossing him into the sea because he says, Go ahead and take me and cast me forth into the sea. Jonah was sparing their lives. Now Jonah 1, 15 and 16 says, So they took, Jonah, took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea seized from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. So these guys tossed Jonah in the sea. And the storm automatically stops. So talk about a sign to show them that God is real. Calling on their gods did nothing. So the men now fear the Lord God who made heaven and earth. The same God that Jonah had. Now Jonah 1.17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And we all know the people who go around saying that it wasn't a well but it was just a big fish. But I believe Jesus when he said in Matthew 12:40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, 
So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus said it was a whale. But in chapter 2, you have Jonah praying while he is inside the belly of the whale. Jonah 2.2 2 says, and, I, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Something you can learn from Jonah is, don't wait until you're in a mess before you call on God. Stay right with God while things are going good, and when things go bad, you'll already be right with God. But he says in verse 5 and 6 in chapter 2, The waters can pass me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. The fact that he says the waters can pass me about, even to the soul, and that he went down to the bottoms of the mountains, and the earth with her bars was about him forever, this leads a lot of people to believe that Jonah died while he was in the whale's belly, which could be true. And then this would show us that there are literal bars in the heart of the earth. And Jesus already lets us know that there are gates in hell. In Matthew sixteen eighteen, it says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there has to be locks on the gates because there is also keys. In Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus has the keys of hell and death. That's what he got when he resurrected. So in the heart of the earth, you've got bars, you've got gates, you've got keys. But in Jonah 2.6, it says, Jonah says the Lord brought up his life from corruption. Just like Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, that is just like how Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, and then he arose from the dead, and neither did his flesh see corruption. And Jonah says in verse 9 and 10, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So God Almighty is almighty and merciful. He prepared a fish that would swallow up Jonah and also made it vomit him back out. He's in complete control over the animals. In Matthew 19, 26, it says, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I don't doubt the story. I believe the whole story. I don't doubt it for a second. I believe it was a real fish, a whale. Uh, I believe that it really swallowed Jonah and really spit him back out. In chapter 3, Jonah goes to Nineveh and obeys the Lord. And who wouldn't after that just happened? But in Jonah 3, 3 and 4, it says, Jonah, So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So now Jonah fears the Lord. And his fear of the Lord is starting to show. He's starting to obey God. He is so ready to obey God after what just happened that he made it to Nineveh in one day, even though it should have taken three days, as the verses say. How we did this is beyond me. But the message was short and simple. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It was a negative message. Very doom and gloom. And it says in verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. So Nineveh had a repentant heart and they saw their guilt of sin and believed God and proclaimed a fast from the greatest to the least. That is just like when God deals with people today. Every person gets dealt with from the least to the greatest. They all have a choice. Some believe on Jesus Christ and some choose not to believe on Jesus Christ. But it's whosoever will from the least to the greatest. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, anybody can be saved. Jonah 3, 6, For a word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and set in ashes. So when a man in great authority and in a place of fame and high notoriety can get right with God, this shows he is a very humble man. Because the higher this world puts you up, the harder it will be to come down. In verse 7 in chapter 3, it says, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So the animals couldn't even eat during this fast. 
In verse 8 it says, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way, and from the violence that is in their hands. So even though we aren't saved by living right, and we aren't kept saved by living right, we should all turn from any evil way that we have. In Proverbs thirteen fifteen, it talks about a bad way. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Proverbs fourteen twelve says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It may seem right, but if it's not God's way, the way it's a way of death. You need to get on the way of righteousness and walk in the light. First John 1 John 1.7 But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. And in verse 9, the king said, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away his fierce anger that we perish not? So this is where you get the saying, There ain't no telling. That's what we say here. There ain't no telling. There ain't no telling what God can do with you if you'll get saved and then live right after you get saved. The king was like, who can tell if God will turn around and repent of what he was going to do to us? He knew there was a chance that if they got right, then God wouldn't kill them physically. Verse 10, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil, and he had that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. God changed his mind about what he would do to Nineveh, because they saw their guilt of sin. They called on God Almighty, changed their wicked works. There's no telling how your life would change if you did that. In chapter 4, you see that Jonah is angry that God spared Nineveh, because Nineveh, uh, deep down Jonah knows that they're going to come against his people. And Jonah 4, 2, it says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, it was not this my saying when I was yet in my country. Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh to get, to get them right with the Lord. He wanted the Lord to destroy them so that they wouldn't be alive to go after Israel. Because Nineveh, capital of Assyria, and Assyria takes the ten northern tribes captive, Jonah didn't want to obey God for this reason. Jonah 4.3, Therefore now, o Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. In 1 Kings 19.4, Elijah requested for himself that he might die. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, for to, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Jonah isn't the only person who considered dying better than living. Jonah wanted to die, though, for the wrong reason, as did Elijah. But Paul wanted to die to be with the Lord. Many times in our, in our Christian life, we just think it's better off to die. And sometimes it's not for the right reason. If the reason is that you're, you want to be with the Lord, that's the right reason. If it's because you're, you're angry with your situation, that's the wrong reason. But in Jonah 4 and verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said it is better for me to die than to live and god said to jonah doest thou what to be angry for the gourd and he said i do what to be angry even unto death then said the lord thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored neither madest it grow which came up in the night and perished in the night and should i not spare nineveh that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left and also much cattle notice that it doesn't really say if jonah ever fixed his attitude you know, Jonah is now angry with God because he's going to spare these people that he don't like. But what a story. Jonah started out running from God. Chapter 2, he was crying out to God. Chapter 3, he's obeying God. And then chapter 4, he's angry with God. You know, you want to have a consistency to your Christian life. What can you get out of this? Look at how Jonah was. Very up and down. First, he's running from God. Then he's crying out to God. Then he's obeying God. 
then he's angry with God. So this is what you need to do. What can you take from what Jonah did? In chapter 2, he's crying out to God. You want to always do that. Continue to just cry out to God. Even when things are going good, cry out to God. And in chapter 3, he's obeying God. You want to continue to obey God. You want to cry out to God and obey God. Now, what he does in chapter 1 and chapter 4, that's what you want to stay away from doing. Never run from God and never get angry with God. Don't get angry with God about any situation that you're in. Don't question God. Don't say, I don't know why God did this. Maybe you don't know why he did it. But remember that God knows what he's doing. He knows best. He knows the end from the beginning. He sees the end from the beginning. You can't. So, cry out to God and obey God. But this has been an overview of the book of Jonah.